Hello and welcome to the Night Watch breaking news edition where we will cover objectively and without any bias politically or otherwise or underlying agendas current news. We're going to focus right now on news related to the coronavirus and as far as some breaking news coming in right now out of the United Kingdom there's quite a bit of concern that forests face an increased risk of being cut down and degraded as a result of the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic, a senior UN official said on Friday. For millions of poor people who have lost casual work in cities and are returning to their homes in rural areas, the only social safety net they have is the waters, the land, and the forest, Mike Wilkie told the Thomson Reuters Foundation. That makes it more likely trees will be felled for food and fuel because a third of the world's people still depend on wood to cook said Wilkie, director of the forestry division at the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. So something interesting now just regarding forestry. And and we realize that the pandemic has had a a positive impact on the environment. Essentially, the environment's been been healing. I'm going outside of the news and just making a, a statement here just because of lack of lack of vehicles and airlines and ships and trucks and everything else being shut down, factories. Um, so, but now there's a, there's a double-edged sword to that and that perhaps the forests are going to suffer in the end. So some news just out a few minutes ago, the World Health Organization says South America is a new COVID, quote, epicenter, and also a statement regarding President Trump's very popular medication, hydroxychloroquine. So just a quick statement here from Mike Ryan, head of World Health Organization's emergency program. South America has become a new epicenter for the disease. We've seen many South American countries with increased numbers of cases, and clearly there is a concern across many of those countries, but certainly the most affected is Brazil at this point. Our hearts go out to those in Brazil. We also note that the government of Brazil has approved the use of hydroxychloroquine for broader use, but we do point to the fact that our current and clinical systemic reviews carried out by the Pan American Health Organization on the current clinical evidence does not support the use of hydroxychloroquine for the treatment of COVID-19, not until the trials are completed and we have clear results. So that's quite controversial. That's coming out of the World Health Organization, who, as you realize, there has been quite a bit of quite a bit of conflict between America and specifically Donald Trump and the World Health Organization. America no longer funding the World Health Organization, the WHO as of now. President Trump being quite in favor of the use of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine um, regarding COVID-19 and even stating that he's been taking it himself. Meanwhile, there's a lot of dispute over whether or not that's valid. Uh, If I were to steer off course from objective news for a moment, I'd probably try it if I had COVID-19. I'm not sure what other treatments are approved at this point. And if a president of a major world economy such as America is taking it, and he seems to be doing quite well with plenty of energy and has not yet contracted the virus, who knows? Maybe it'll in the long run end up being something that will be determined to be effective and perhaps not, we will see. So that was outside of the objectiveness. Now let's get back to objective news, just a statement on hydroxychloroquine. So here we go regarding the dispute between the United States of America and the World Health Organization. The US is demanding an immediate start to the WHO review. The United States called on the World Health Organization on Friday to begin working immediately on investigating the source of the novel coronavirus as well as its handling of the response to the pandemic, pandemic, Edward Baron reports. The United States is demanding that the WHO begin work immediately on, on investigating both the source of the novel coronavirus and its handling of the response to the pandemic. Earlier this week, President Trump threatened in a tweeted letter to the WHO's Director General to permanently halt funding to the United Nations Agency if it did not commit to reforms within 30 days and to consider his country's membership, the membership of America. Trump accuses the agency of being China-centric. On Friday, Director General Tedros at Adahan defended their actions. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the WHO has worked day and night to coordinate the global response at all three levels of the organization. 
just a quick sideline, some news. More than 5.1 million cases of COVID-19 have been reported worldwide with over 300,000 deaths. The virus emerged in the central Chinese city of Wuhan late last year. So outside of objective news, just for full transparency's sake, I just want to point out that I recall when the pandemic was labeled by the WHO as an epidemic. At that particular time, I was actually traveling through the various epicenters, including Hong Kong, including several other countries, and it was being called an epidemic, and the WHO was very reluctant to label it as a pandemic, and I remember them waiting and waiting until it met a certain level of criteria. Meanwhile, we were seeing all types of restrictions throughout hot zones, throughout various parts of Asia, that I just happened to be traveling through at the time. And I could tell with my own eyes and ears and seeing what was happening in countries in Asia that, and seeing how empty airports were and seeing how quick this was spreading around the world, I don't think it took a rocket scientist or a genius to realize that this was truly becoming a pandemic. So I will steer back on course to objective news. That was just my personal statement. I don't know why it took so long to label the epidemic as a pandemic. So kind of breaking my own rules here in, in going into some personal opinion. Let's get back to objectivity. Okay, so moving on to some other, other news regarding the coronavirus, scanning for that which would be most relevant to you at this time. If you just give me a moment here as I look for relevant breaking news, there's quite a bit of news right now from around the world. And let's jump into this. So there is some news just out a few minutes ago. Digital twins can help create healthier cities after coronavirus. So let's find out what this is about. This is out of Bangkok. The use of new technologies such as virtual reality by planners to help design more sustainable and healthier cities has accelerated during the coronavirus pandemic, urban experts said on Friday. The respiratory disease, which has infected more than 5 million people worldwide, has already triggered the widespread use of robots, drones, and artificial intelligence to track the virus and deliver services. Now planners and authorities are also turning to new technologies, including so-called digital twins of cities or virtual three-dimensional replicas to tackle future health crisis, said Michael Jansen, chief executive of City Zenith, a Chicago-based technology firm. It's quite interesting. A digital twin that could track the progress of the virus in real time is the perfect platform for aggregating and distributing information at scale in a crisis, he said. Digital twins would also help assess the and implement economic recovery plans for affected cities and urban regions, he said. Virtual Singapore, a digital twin of the island city, models and simulates climate change, infrastructure planning, and public health studies, and can be used in crisis management, a spokesman at the government technology agency said. That's quite interesting. Modeling a city's streets, transport networks, buildings, and population can help planners predict how design changes would affect them said Fabian Dembski, a researcher at the High Performance Computing Center in Stuttgart. Cities are complex, but if we can simulate factors such as climate, air quality, traffic flow, and movement of people, then planning decisions can be more efficient, equitable, and inclusive. But even these models and simulations do not, do not capture human emotions, which play a big role in the success of urban design, is another point there. So that's quite interesting, that news just out. And it seems to be one strategy being looked at at how to best control and combat the novel coronavirus, especially in the future with, with pandem pandemics that may occur uh, in the course of time, as has happened in the past. So just some more information from the World Health Organization, quite defensive at this time. The Director General saying that since the beginning of the pandemic, the WHO has worked day and night to coordinate the global response at all three levels of the organization, providing technical advice, catalyzing political solidarity, mobilizing resource, and coordinating logistics, and much more. We updated the plan earlier this month with an estimate that WHO will require 1.7 billion U.S. dollars to fund our response to COVID-19 this year. So far, almost 800 million, million U.S. dollars have been pledged and received, leaving a gap of just over 900 million dollars. 
So there's obviously some back and forth between America and the World Health Organization that is quite problematic um, in that the WHO needs funding. The question is, did the WHO help and who did the WHO help? And I don't know that they helped America a whole lot or, or the country that you may be in at this time. Um, I'm sure that they did try to help in various ways, um, but at the end, it, it, it's a bit, a bit questionable in terms of waiting so long and so late to sound the ultimate alarm bell, which is the pandemic. That, that word just didn't come out until, until quite late in the process, in, in the opinion of many, including many within America, including the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Another story just in, caught between climate and virus threats, migrants have no safe place to go. This is out of Barcelona. Ali Mohammed, a 50-year-old Afghan nomad, lost most of his sheep due to a harsh drought in 2018. The following year, his home was destroyed by floods that also killed his son and two daughters. Very tragic. These days, he lives at a camp for displaced people in Herat province with his surviving teenage daughter, they are cold, hungry, and cannot meet their basic needs, according to a new report on climate migration in South Asia. Increasingly, people in Afghanistan are being displaced not by conflict, but by the impacts of climate change. This is according to the research organization in Afghanistan, Tadbir Consulting. It is an untold story, and many families like Ali's are suffering, living in limbo without protection and struggling to get by, he added in a statement on the report published by the Climate Action Network South Asia and Charity Action Aid. Now those forced from their homes by weather-related disaster in impoverished, war-ravaged Afghanistan, about 1.2 million people at the end of 2019, must also contend with the threat of the novel coronavirus. Since the outbreak began, Afghanistan has registered more than 3,600 cases and over 100 deaths from COVID-19. Iman said infection rates were likely much higher, including among displaced people, than low levels of testing might suggest. So there's low levels of testing, which are affecting the results most likely. Before the pandemic, he visited several camps in Herat, bordering virus-slammed Iran, where he saw people living more than 10 to a small tent without clean drinking water, health care, or sanitation. Social distancing cannot be properly observed, and due to lack of access to adequate food, health services, and proper shelter, risk of infection by coronavirus is higher among the displaced people, he told Reuters Foundation, Thompson Reuters Foundation by email. Migration experts are worried that the COVID-19 respiratory disease could quickly spread in crowded, unhygienic camps and also in centers where people shelter to stay safe in storms or floods or because their homes have been destroyed. And we've heard some news recently out of, out of Bangladesh in terms of refugee camps that are experiencing much, much of the same type of situation. Another story just in, coronavirus fuels cyber sex trafficking fears for children in Southeast Asia. This is an awful, awful situation. I will read to you now some breaking news out of Bangkok and also Phnom Penh. Cyber sex traffickers are likely to exploit the coronavirus pandemic to target more children across Southeast Asia for online sexual abuse, child rights activists said on Thursday. The global spread of cheap high-speed internet and the rise in mobile phone ownership has fueled cyber sex trafficking in recent years. With children from Thailand to the Philippines, being exploited over live streams for paying clients worldwide. Just awful. At least 165 countries have shut schools due to the COVID-19 outbreak, impacting more than 1.5 billion children who will have more time to spend online, leaving them prey to sexual predators, said the United Nations Children's Agency, UNICEF. UNICEF estimates 1.8 million children are sex trafficked every year, but this does not include cyber sex trafficking. Spending more time online may heighten the risk of grooming predators trying to meet children and an increase of self-generated images as well as cyberbullying, Rachel Har Harvey, an advisor for UNICEF, told the Thomson Reuters Foundation. The U.S. Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, which has trained authorities in Cambodia and the Philippines to tackle cyber sex trafficking, this week issued a statement warning about the increased risk of online abuse due to school closures. In the Philippines, considered to be the epicenter of the live stream sex abuse trade, activists are concerned about a spike in exploitation as many children are abused at home by their own relatives who can earn up to $100 per broadcast. 
because people are locked down, possibilities for online sex exploitation are high, said Evelyn Pingle, communications director for International Justice Mission, IJM, in the Philippines. Criminal minds can take advantage of the situation, she said, urging communities to be vigilant against such abuse. In Thailand, the Internet Crimes Against Children Police-led task force said it had been receiving reports of online sex abuse on a daily basis with victims as young as eight years old. The task force last year said that Thai cyber sex traffickers were targeting teenage boys from wealthy families, often posing as girls before persuading them to film themselves. And I'll leave out the word. Campaigners in neighboring Cambodia said they had seen a rise in online sexual abuse since schools there closed last week. Child sex offenders online are taking advantage of the situation to get in touch with, groom, and lure children to sexual activities, said Simlian Sila, director of the Children Protection Charity Action Pour Le Enfants, APLE. So quite a concern there regarding cyber sex, and it, it does certainly make sense with schools closed and predators out there. Um, it, it, it's just quite awful. One more story that we'll touch on is regarding... Ebola. Significant progress has been made containing the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, with cases down from more than 120 per week in mid-April 2019 to between zero and three cases per week in the last four weeks. This is just out today. New cases in the last 21 days have been confined to one health zone, according to the World Health Organization. So some good news regarding controlling Ebola. So that's it for today's news updates. Thank you very much. That's some, some highlights from around the world. Thank you for joining the Night Watch Show.